I am right. very impressed. There are two new to me people. Herland is from Norway and has a record of an outstanding number of interviews. She's a very good interviewer and her selection for whom to interview has been outstanding. The other journalist is very young, 22, 23. Her name is Whitney Webb. Uh, I don't like to listen to her speak because she speaks like a 20-something. But she writes well and she's got very good sources. And she's written on several different subjects and I, I have not yet found her lying to me and I have not yet found her uh, bending things inappropriately. That's not to say she won't do it next week, but I'm very pleased with both of them. Um, as I told uh, Dawn, Today's session is, can be titled either 30 Years of Subversion or how to, how to Create a Revolution. It is basically the story of what the United States has done to subvert any number of nation states beginning, well, beginning around 1990. And the reason I say around 1990 is that the techniques have changed. Before 1990, the CIA was doing a number of subversive things to various nations that were not our vassals. The United States ruling establishment sees two kinds of nations, vassal states and enemy states. Uh, so if you're not a vassal, you're an enemy. Before 1990, there were uh, secret government programs to subvert these nation states. Around 1990, the National Endowment for Democracy and George Soros Open Society started doing things openly with government funding, what previously had been done by three-letter agencies covertly. The interview we're going to watch today is by uh, Ms. Herland and Joaquin Flores, who is a journalist who works out of Belgrade. Am I pronouncing that correctly? And because he has analyzed the methodology, they have an interesting uh, interview and they will cover Tunisia, Libya, Egypt times two because Mubarak was number one and al-Sisi was number two. Syria, Yugoslavia, and Ukraine. I don't think I'm missing any others, but if, I'm, if they add something else. But the methodology is identical. The methodology is recruiting people from those nation states who are unhappy about the price of bread, uh, the price of gasoline, um, their favorite singer not getting on television or not. They cultivate them, they finance them, and then under given certain signals, they get them out into the streets. Then they have photographers and journalists interviewing the right ones, the, the very special ones, who are going to give the journalists and the, the TV cameras the message that we want these people out. It's part of winning the hearts and minds, especially the minds, of the Western public. As a matter of fact, I, I left one out that they don't discuss. You may recall that a couple of weeks ago, very shortly before the assassination of... Uh, Suleiman. Yes. Uh, there was a, a, a riot outside the American embassy in Baghdad. That was also generated because the United States wanted to put pressure on the premier of Iraq to do certain things vis-a-vis -vis the economy. So the methodology is the same. Uh, the goal for each of the revolutions is regime change or regime modification, getting a, a non-compliant regime to be compliant. 
And with that as introduction, So welcome to the Harland Report, uh, Mr. Joaquin Flores. You are a political scientist, a graduate from California State University in Los Angeles. You are a journalist and an accomplished editor, and we're so happy to have you here. You come from all the way from Belgrade, and we find that especially interesting as a Serbian Kosovo and Yugoslavia really was the starting point for a new kind of thinking uh, in our modern world regarding how to create a revolution. And we know about Gene Sharp and his book about the same theme, and we're going to discuss now how this all happened uh, and details around what went on as we saw revolutions created both against Milosevic in Serbia and the aftermath of that, it wasn't exactly non-violent, uh, as Gene Sharp and other authors spoke of. We also saw the Arab Spring, which very effectively turned into an Arab winter. We've seen both Libya and Tunisia and Syria as well in dire uh, problems. Uh, so first and foremost, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I think that, and many would agree, that Belgrade really is one of the central hubs of the world. Certainly, it's where East meets West. And when you look at the history of Belgrade, uh, the level of diplomacy, the level of intrigue, uh, all of the sort of plots uh, have all been hatched from Belgrade. And many of the things, as you were saying, that are occurring in the world now uh, were sort of rolled out in prototype form uh, in Yugoslavia, in Belgrade. And so when we look at what is happening in Belgrade and, and why Belgrade is so central. We can really begin to understand these co the color revolution phenomenon. We can understand the EU. We can understand NATO and the relationship between the two. And we can even begin to see some of the cracks uh, between the EU and NATO happening surrounding Serbia. And I think that when we sort of untangle that big question mark of Belgrade, we can really understand, as you were saying, what happened in Syria? What happened in Libya? What happened in Ukraine? And you know, you can see like they used to say all roads lead back to Rome. Well, with the color revolution, all the roads lead back to Belgrade. Uh, certainly so. And many have spoken of the dramatic change in foreign policy that came out of the 1993, even before could be argued. Uh, a senator or a former senator, Ron Paul, argues that it went all the way back to the New Deal in the 30s in the United States. Uh, with the, you know, the growth of the Federal Reserve and, and many, many issues there. But uh, if we look at the changes in foreign policy in the United States with Paul Wolfowitz and the coup from uh, 1993 and onward, um, Serbia becomes very central because this was really Yugoslavia and, 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 and the Kosovo War in Serbia was really the first uh, time we saw uh, what can we say? A right. planned revolution. A planned revolution. And, and that is so very interesting. You know, Yugoslavia had one of the most dynamic and growing economies in Europe. And there was certainly a plan hatched uh, as early as the mid 70s, at least, uh, that they knew that eventually Tito was going to pass away. And then they said, well, once he passes away, we're going to put our people and our pieces together. And we're going to start to sort of break it apart from the inside using a playbook. This is it's a science. It's an art, but it's also a science. And the science to this is really sort of understanding and unraveling the socio-political, ethnological dimensions of a society. Because you can always take a country and break it apart further. You could always take the French and you could break the South from the North. You could take Brittany, separate it from Paris, and so forth. You can take any country that you can see in Spain today with separatism, or in Italy, right? Venice. Venice should be a country. So these are interesting debates and times that we live in, but we can see that this happened in Yugoslavia when they broke it apart into its old constituent parts. So it's um, now as a process, it's planned. And I think that the most important thing for people to understand today is that what they are seeing, whether it was in Yugoslavia in the 90s and the war that, that, that happened as you were describing, or in Libya, or in Syria and Ukraine, is that they were not spontaneous uprisings of people. 
Someone like myself with 20 years experience in community organizing, who spent seven years in labor unions organizing, we know that all these things are planned because we have to do the turnout and organize the people to turn out. They don't show up unless they are called and planned and you bust them in, you have to bring sandwiches, you have to do the, uh, the phone calls. And it's a whole process. And there's graphs and charts, there's war rooms, maps. And it's not just like, uh, you know, thousands of people are mad about something and they show it spontaneously. That's the great mythology that they're teaching right now in the West about democracy, is that these uprisings are spontaneous. Now, people have legitimate concerns. People have legitimate grievances. But they don't just manifest on October 1st, you know, in Central Square without millions and millions and millions of dollars spent to plan it. Hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of professional organizers on full-time salaries to make that happen. So it's a really interesting process, and we see it happening everywhere. Yes, and it seems to be a somewhat uh, more modern method uh, that we've seen in recent years. Although one would have to say, if you look at South America and what has been happening there for many years as well, of course, yes. foreign agents, and, and this goes for the, the KGB in the olden days, and, you know, I mean, of course, and, and also the MI6 and MI5 and all. Right. So, so that's quite clear. It's always been going on, some organizing of revolts and that kind of thing. But right. it seems to be, um, yeah, watermark, really. Yes. Uh, on the Serbian uh, movement uh, back in the day, and and we've discussed too the the growth of the Otpor. Right. Uh, right. And, and and please explain. Tell us a little bit about that because that's vital to understand yes. for the viewers. Absolutely. So as you were describing quite well, of course, there's always been agents, MI5, MI6, CIA, KGB, whatever, and their job was to go into a country, make contacts with elites and to try to get some portion of the elite to turn against the main group of ruling elites. So it was always to create an intra-elite fight. And then you have a coup. You might result in a milita military dictatorship or some kind of democracy. Whatever it is, it was according to the needs of the greater power organizing the change of government, the regime change. Mm -hmm. But what has happened in the last 30 years is that the science of community organizing was used to sort of create this veneer of a popular democracy movement happening. So in the past, 100 years ago, you might, you might have one group of elites, they're contacted by the CIA, the military, the generalissimos, the agribusiness, and they will depose a king or they will depose a parliamentary elected president or whatever. But what has happened in the last, say, say 30 years, has been to use new methods of media, to use especially the internet, starting in the early 90s, and to use these new methods of communication. Of course, more recently, Twitter was massively used in Libya, massively used in Syria, right? Twitter storms. And they use the combination of new methods of technology, new methods of popular organizing, to simulate a popular uprising. I mean, that is an incredible simulacrum it's like a holographic reality that we've been introduced to because the people watching it on TV, and you might, they focus on people. I mean, literally when you're planning these things, you find the people, the organizers like I used to be, we find the people who are already prepared to have the talking points to talk to the media. And they look like just a guy on the street, a student, whatever, hairdresser. And they seem, and they are, but they've been prepped, you know, say this, this, and this. And then that's what CNN captures. And then people think this is what's happening. Also, people are protesting for something very banal, something very boring. I mean, important to them, but they're not asking for regime change. All these mass protests, people were saying, oh, we're protesting because the electric tax rate is going to go from 15% to 19%. Oh, we're taxing because there was some change in the code, and we're protesting to see this code overturned. And for example, in the Tahrir Square and the so-called Arab Spring in Egypt, it was a question of the price of bread that yes, had gone up. That's right. It was not goodbye Mubarak. You know, it was actually, let's fix the price of bread. Now, interestingly, the whole issue of bread prices, uh, the FAO, UN FAO index, um, determined that when that price gets to a certain point, 
that that's going to lead towards a popular revolt. It's like, I think it's 210. It's an index number. And when you get to that number, you are within 99% certainty that people will be out in the streets. So what happened with the collapse of the housing market bubble in 2006, 2007, that they introduced through the Federal Reserve quantitative easing. QE1, QE2, QE Unlimited. Now, on paper, they told people, well, this is $700 billion. But there was no limit to the number of $700 billion checks that could be written. So what they then did is they cornered the perishable goods market, especially those companies which were marketing mostly in agribusiness to Middle East countries. Then they picked their friends. Well, we're going to give Turkey a break. We're going to give Saudi Arabia a break. We're going to give Jordan a break, etc. But Libya, Iran, Syria, Egypt, they're going to get hit full brunt. So then these governments were scrambling to subsidize the prices. And we all know that subsidizes, subsidies often go sideways for many, many reasons. But I mean, it's, it's a, a stopgap, you know, a short-term solution to keep people from starving, probably legitimate. But it's ultimately not sustainable. And these were bread riots. They weren't saying the government should go. They, should, they were saying the bread should go in my stomach, you see. And then you pick maybe 20, 30 people from the audience that you've pre-organized to speak to CNN. And then they say, we want the government to go. And then the people watching it think that there's you know, 40,000 people or 500,000 people on an issue that's not their issue. That's the holographic reality that they've produced. And uh, interestingly enough, also with the Tahrir Square, when you look closely at some of the photographs that came out of the early days there, there are complete replicas of the famous painting from the French Revolution with the lady, right. with the bare breast and the right. little boy next to her, and they're all on a pile of rubble. Right. And it's replicas of that. Yes. And, and, and many of the Egyptians were describing also how truckloads of brick stones were, you know, flooding right. uh, the, the Tahrir Square. For, and they were told, go take the brick and throw a brick. Right, to, throw, to make it a scene. And uh, it's like from uh, Les Miserables, you know, they just sort of took this script. And an interesting uh, fact as well uh, was how Yusuf Kardawi, uh, the Qatari-based uh, head of the... Muslim Brotherhood came in, was flown in on Fridays to hold Friday prayer on the Tahrir Square. So a small signal of which kind of driving forces also were interested right. in removing Mubarak and creating the situation, which we yes. obviously know since the Muslim Brotherhood right. took power there later. And these people are, well, if we were to politically define them, I mean, they're quite reactionary. They're Islamists, they're Salafists. And what they were able to do also from Qatar, the al Thani dynasty owning Al Jazeera, which they took from the BBC, MI6 project, and then they made this sort of, gave it this whole kind of left-wing popular veneer that the Islamists in the streets were actually crypto-socialists or unconscious socialists, that this was actually a proletarian revolution. So then they got all the Western Trotskyists and anarchists and youth from the left to think that what they were seeing was a left-wing democracy socialism movement when in fact it was, well, the unconscious part was an honest bread protest. And those people legitimately were hungry. But the activists were Islamists. I mean, the ones who are head chopping today in Syria. Same guys. And yet they had the talking points set up so that they could speak in the language of the left to Western audiences. So it's interesting you mentioned the French Revolution because this was like stage managed by Westerners from the school of Gene Sharp and so forth. As, and as we were saying, these roads lead also back to Belgrade because Otpor uh, originated there and was developed upon the community organizing uh, playbook by Sololinsky. And Sololinsky, what his major contribution was that would ultimately become a weaponized US foreign intelligence project uh, led in part intellectually by Gene Sharp, but really operationalized by his protégés like Sergeant Popovich. That you can take a segment of society and you can exploit um, many, many interesting aspects of what it means to be a human being in society. Because people have many different frustrations. There are 
family f frustrations, psychosexual frustrations, people have ambiguities about their sexuality, people have questions about the nature of class systems. Are the rich rich because they're greedy? Is it because they work harder? Is it because they're corrupt? You know, what is it? And there's these tensions in society. And then people internalize these tensions. You know, they may have romantic failure. They may have just random histrionic fits. And then these are politicized, right? They're weaponized into, and then you mobilize millions of people in the streets. Each has their own little drummer that they're marching to, right? But then the organizer's job, like my job used to be, to put a big banner so then the CNN says, this is everyone's out here for one thing. When you look closely into the Otpod, uh, as it was first called, uh, I, I, I remember, uh, it was actually two brothers who, in 1998, just felt, you know, I mean, they were opposed to the Milosevic uh, government and wanted change, like you so say, that there's always people. Yes. And the opposition in a country is a healthy thing. Yes. It's an excellently good thing to have, but yes. the problem is maybe that uh, foreign forces come in and play on yes, that. Yes, they manipulated. Yes, and yes. they got in touch with uh, some of the Americans who came there and taught them basically how to make a revolution. That's right. Uh, and it's interesting, then the, the organization changed names to Canvas. Now Canvas, uh, yes. Yes, and then it became quite a large uh, network. Uh, mm -hmm. network there, yes, yes. Uh, which developed further on the basis of, and it's interesting for the viewer to to buy the book of Gene Sharp, How to Make Revolution, something yes. like that. You mm -hmm. get it on Amazon. Yes. Uh, and it's really explained very carefully, non-violent uh, uh, revolution. Then, of yes. course, of course, it turns violent uh, right. later That's at a later secret. stage. Right. Yes, yes, let's <laughs> not talk about that. But right. it's interesting. And, and that same canvas uh, uh, methods used in Belgrade to overthrow Milosevic at the time was the same, was applied on the Arab Spring, both in Tahrir and several of the other uh, Arab right. nations at the time, and also in Libya, as a matter of fact, uh, and, and, and again also in Syria, although it failed in Syria, yes. as we all know now. Right. But uh, it's interesting how it structured this yes. uh, all is. That's the key. It's very structured. And there's a science to it, like an art, but a science. And I think that when you begin to deconstruct what happened with Otpor, now Canvas, you can see in the symbolism, you can see, well, there's the whatever, 192 uh, methods of uh, non nonviolent strategic organizing, 192 different sort of tactics that you can apply. There's like a list, the books, like you said. Um, there's also uh, what Sergei Popovich has written in English is available and can be downloaded. So this is not conspirology. You know, this is not my theory or your theory. This is actually how it's done. Right? Things have to get done a certain way. It's not a conspiracy that engines of, for cars are built a certain way. I mean, there has to be a blueprint or the car won't function. And there has to be a blueprint for revolutions or the revolution won't take place. And, and it's interesting, when you look at Canvas and the methods that are clearly written out there is, okay, you're going to move into a country uh, where you want to have regime change. And then you analyze, okay, who are the driving forces or who are the groups that go with the president or right. the current uh, political structures? Maybe that president is, is very popular with the people. Okay, so how can we weaken him? Then you get in touch with oppositional groups uh, that do not like him for some reason. In some of the Arab countries, to be a bit frank, you know, I mean, right. the oppositional groups want to have power, and same goes for some of the African countries, maybe as much in the West too. They want to get to the power in order to yes. take the money because right. they're tired of watching right. the current elite taking all the that's money. It. So sometimes you even have oppositional groups. That's really the basic and you know right. thing of it. And then you make sure to get all the information and to fund right. precisely those oppositional groups so they get very strong. Yes. And they also may infiltrate the groups that belong to the current president, whatever. As well. And this way, and thirdly, you also need to have a lot of arrests. Yes. And then you call the Western media, whom are your friends, because the, those who own the newspapers are the same guys that also want to overthrow that government, maybe, I mean, sometimes to get the, you know, the resources in that country are destabilized yes. for one reason or another. 
uh, and then you're very happy when you're get ar- getting arrested because then there's the pictures of it. And there again, it there it is, The Guardian, New York right. Times, they all have yes. simultaneously the same photographs like we yes. saw the when ISIS right. came 2014. On one day, we were all shown right. the same brilliantly Western right. produced, uh, produced yes. photographs we know because right. when you know the, the, the Arab, yeah. yes, and then the Arab nations, they're yes. excellent at so many things, yes. but they have their own Arabic, proud right. Arab way of doing yes, it. Yes, yes. And that's not Western photography. Right. So It was very evident. It, yeah. it's, it, it's evident. It's, um, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned what was very interesting as well. Um, with Libya, you know, when you go in to overthrow a government or to attack its leadership, you don't attack the weaknesses, you attack the strengths. So I remember, for example, they had, uh, there's a program in the United States uh, called Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. She, saw, she often covers some very good things as well and some other things. She maybe not asked as difficult questions as she ought to ask. So she had a gentleman from uh, Doctors Without Borders supposedly. It's a Western-backed NGO funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, USAID, and George Soros. They do some good work as well. However, this guy was also representative of the Transitional National Council, or whatever. The TNC was the sort of the government that the U.S. was trying to pr- promote as the government following Gaddafi. And one of the wonderful things about Gaddafi's Libya is they didn't have much of a standing army, They had popular militias, so the citizens were armed, right? So you had the right to bear arms, you had popular group committees, and if the country was going to get attacked, the citizens go to the weapons depot, they get the weapons, everyone's trained in weapons. This gentleman was actually on the air attacking this very democratic and very healthy aspect of Libyan society and saying, well, the the main problem is that Gaddafi doesn't even have an army. You know, this is why we need to overthrow Gaddafi, because it's not safe, because he doesn't even have an army. So now you have a dictator that doesn't have an army? I mean, what, what argument were they really making? I mean, they really fall over themselves trying to make these arguments. Or in Tahrir Square, they tried to say, oh, this is a popular left-wing democracy movement against Mubarak. Now, many people didn't like Mubarak for many good reasons, in many part, especially among uh, religious communities or those who have sympathies towards the Palestinians, Of course, Mubarak has had a very centrist or realistic policy towards Israel and cooperated towards closing down tunnels and and so forth so that Palestinians under blockade couldn't get things from Egypt. So many people in Egypt and many people in the Arab world have sympathies towards the Palestinians, for example. So they didn't like Mubarak. But what they attacked him for was that he refused to mobilize support to attack Syria. So they had to get Mubarak out. It wasn't just the reasons that we were told. So this whole axis and the way it spins around, and when you really dig in the way that people should, I think there's so many levels and so many layers. And what we find most disturbing in global media coverage, East and West, but especially in the West today, is the superficial treatment. And we're just supposed to take this very, very simplified people versus power, goodies versus baddies, you know, the people in power are always wrong. And, that, and I think it really plays upon f- uh, mass psychology and Freudian psychology. You know, it really plays upon our desire, because many people are, are, are living unfulfilled lives. And we're really living, we really have a crisis in the West, I think, as well, where people, we don't really have the sort of purpose and meaning in our lives that we want. And when, when another group comes in and says, oh, these are political problems. These can be solved through overthrowing the government. This really resonates with people. And what's interesting is that it resonates less with people in the countries that are having the color revolutions. It resonates more with Western audiences who are projecting their neuroses onto foreign populations. They have their own reasons. So there's kind of, as you said, westernizing the reasons. It's actually Orientalism. It's actually just projecting onto them their own neuroses, right? So that's, and that was actually done very well in, in Yugoslavia. There was a, a inter-ethnic conflict that the West was promoting in Yugoslavia. 
and they made it be a people versus power conflict. Well, there'll probably be another conflict again, God, God, God forbid, but in Serbia again with either or both Albania and Bosnia because the United States is pushing the government in Sarajevo to change the government completely so that the Serbian Autonomous Republic of Republika Srpska no longer autonomous. Well, the Russians already said in 2014, Lavrov said, should Sarajevo foolishly take the American advice and change the constitution from a federal system to a unitary state where no longer will the Serbs have their own autonomous government? Well, the Russians said that they would recognize a Crimea-like process of referendum. I don't think that the Americans with Camp Bond Steel in Kosovo and with the heavy investment with the Saudis in Sarajevo are going to let that happen without a fight. So we live in tremendously dangerous times and so many of these things really, you know, take us back to this color revolution process. And on that note, uh, Mr. Joaquin Flores, uh, thank you very much for your contribution in discussing how to make a revolution, and we shall continue in yet another program uh, with the same topic. Thank you. One element that they didn't get to this week, and I don't know that we will get uh, approach the second uh, interview, but the next step in some of these color revolutions you could see in the Maidan, because when they could not get everything they wanted from Yanukovych by having the crowds in the streets, then they had their own hired sharpshooters high up in certain, in three separate hotels, I believe, shooting down at the crowd, but very specifically shooting on both sides, so that the government forces thought that the crowd was shooting at them, and the crowd thought that the government forces was shooting at them. So, of course, minor chaos turned into major chaos, turned into a situation where Yanukovych fled because he was unwilling to fire on um, Ukrainians, but the United States forces were not at all loath to fire on both sides. Uh, so uh, when they don't get everything they want by revolution, they're perfectly willing to take up uh, further forms of violence. I'm going to stop there. This is a short session today, and I'm open for questions. I want to call attention to one element, and Joaquin pointed to the fact that um, this form of attack is intentionally creating what he calls a holographic reality, and the war really is now for the minds of people. And the holographic reality is being created for Western minds. Western politicians have already been purchased, body and soul. The CIA told that to Paul Craig Roberts 40 years ago. And we're going to be looking further at how they are capturing our minds. Thank you. Thank you, Don. You can turn the lights on. And as far as, and unless there are questions, well, you can go ahead. I, I do. Um, in there, they said um, there's a definite difference between the Arab media and the Western media. So, what, what does he mean? The Arab media, I, I'm, I'm not sure what they meant, but what, what I will interpret that as meaning the Arab media is reporting what is happening. The Western media is reporting what they want you to see as happening. I'll give you an example. Everywhere in the West, it was reported that Osama bin Laden died something like 2009 or something like that. Correct? 
His obituary was printed in the Cairo newspaper in 2002. And I think it was printed in a Pakistani newspaper in the same year. He died of kidney failure within 60 days of 9-11. He was in a, an American hospital getting treated for kidney, di uh, for kidney failure, receiving dialysis on September 10th of 2001. So everything that the American people and the West has been told is part of what Joaquin is calling a holographic reality. And that holographic, there's an essay by Wayne Madsen that we will be dealing with in one fashion or another in the next few weeks. Because Wayne is taking very seriously the creation of a totally synthetic reality for the Western audience.